I'm very thankful to the Lord for many blessings. As individual, as family, as church, we have received many blessings and we have many reasons to praise the Lord for his loving kindness with us. Brethren, in the book of the Deuteronomy, we find in chapter 28, as was read, verses 2 and 15. And all these blessings shall come up on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And verse 15, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, all this curse shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Uh, Brother, you, you know the meaning of the word Deuteronomy is the second or repeated legislation. And before his, his death, Moses was concerned about the future of God's people. And all this book, Deuteronomy, is a repetition of the laws and warnings to the people. And uh, Sister White says here, commenting this book, it says, she says, you see, the great leader was filled with fear that the people would depart from God. In a most sublime and thrilling address, he set before them the blessings that would be theirs on condition of obedience and the curses that would follow upon transgression. Then brethren, and the, the God's people, they were to hear these messages, blessings and curses to remind them about their duty. We would like to talk only about blessings, but you will not be realistic. Because the same God that promised blessing for us, for the obedient, he mentions curses upon the disobedient. Mm -hmm. And the, at the end of the book, especially 29, the, uh, the Bible says, chapter 30, God put before us, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to, rec to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. cursing. Now we have a wonderful counsel here. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Then, Brad, we have before us blessings and curse. But God gives us a counsel. Choose life. life. Choose blessings. Now, we will not consider the book of Deuteronomy today. It was just, just an introduction. We will consider some blessings and woes in the New Testament. When we read Matthew chapter 5, we find blessings. I was counting here, brethren, in Matthew chapter 5, we find five, uh, eight blessings. And in Matthew chapter 23, we find eight woes. It seems some coincidence, but we, we find eight blessings and eight woes. Chapter 23. Let us consider uh, the woes first. Chapter 23, Matthew. We, we find here, Brad, especially Christ was finished his work 
among God's, God's people, among Jews' people. But the, Christ was facing a very serious hindrance for his message. Do you remember who were the main hindrance for God, of Christ's work? Matthew chapter 23, Christ speaks about the Pharisees. They were the leaders of God's people. And they were the, the main hindrance for God's people accepting Christ as its Savior. And what was the final destiny of the, that people? And the Spirit of Prophecy says that because of the, the leaders who reject Christ, most of the people, they reject Christ also. Let us read uh, Matthew 23, verse 13. Who would like to read this verse? <laughs> Sister, could please. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Thank you. But what was the main reason of this accusation against them? It was wrong to be a scribe. No, it was wrong to be a Pharisee. Today, the, the, the word Pharisee has a different connotation. But at that time, no. They were very zealous to keep the law and to teach the law. But what, there is a key word here, verse, uh, verse 13. What the key word of the problem of the Pharisees and scribes? Hypocrites. He says, but woe unto thee and you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That was the main problem. And uh, by their behavior, Christ said, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in, neither suffer it them that are entering to go in. They were not working just for their own perdition. They were, were working against perdition of others. And brethren, there is a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy which says, it's terrible to be lost, but it's much more terrible to be the hindrance to others to be lost, to be saved. Let us think seriously about that. Now, I'd like to, to invite someone else to read uh, verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 14 or 15? Uh, 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. The, the Pharisees and scribes, they gave a, a, a very wonderful demonstration of piety. They had long prayers. Can we have long prayers, brethren? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Some. Where and when? Yeah. I can close my, my door and I can spend the whole night praying. That's nice. Not too long. Not too long with that. But they used to do that in public, to show up <coughs> piety. That's a pretense. They are not, they are not pious. That's a, what a pretense. And let us be careful with our long prayers, especially in public. The same rebuke falls upon many in our day who make a high profession of piety. Their lives are stained by selfishness and avarice. Yet they throw over it all a garment of seeming purity, and thus for a time deceive their fellow men. But they cannot deceive God. He reads every purpose of the heart, and will judge every man according to his deeds. Brethren, I can deceive people. I, we can deceive men, but we cannot deceive God. 
And God will judge us not only according to our external deeds, but He will judge us according to mind. our heart, our minds. <laughs> Uh, verse 15, please, someone else. 23, verse 15. Woe well, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye come past sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more than the child of hell than yourselves. Brethren, were the Pharisees missionary people? Huh. They went through the world to make a proselyte. What was the, the bad, bad side? When they used to convert one people, one person, that person be become, became worse than them. It's wrong to be missionary? No. But what kind of missionary are we? It depends on our if you are related with Christ, you are a good missionary, but otherwise, we, we, we create problems. Verse 16 to 18. I would like to read. Sister Barbara, could you read, please? Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Mm -hmm. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Mm -hmm. I was reading that uh, to be a high priest in the time of Christ, People, they were, they were willing to pay one million dollars to be a high priest. It was a very profitable position. They made a lot of money for being high priest. What was their main concern as high priest? To keep power and money. That was their goal. And the day pretend to be very zealous about the temple. <coughs> but they were very zealous about themselves. Now, verse 23 and 24. Who would like to read? Sister Susan. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier things of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a nap and swallow a camel. Hmm. Brethren, have here a very deep message. Christ repeats several times here the word hypocrite, hypocrites. Very, several times. And we learn that when the Bible repeats a message, it's because it's very, very important, very essential. But uh, the first part of the verse, Christ says, for ye pay tithe. Were they condemned by, for paying tithe? No. What was the accusation that Christ made against them? He paid tithes of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. We can, be, we can be very meticulous about many details of Christian life, and we can forget the essential. That was the problem. Christ was very clear. He said, this ought it to have done. Then he approved to pay in tithes. He approved that. And not to leave the order undone. What were the orders here? Mercy, judgment, and faith. 
Then, brother, we can have, we can be very particular in several details of Christian life. And we can observe others. Oh, that brother is not observing this detail. That brother is not, that sister. But we forget the, the main point, the essential in the plan of salvation. And Christ says in verse 24, He blind guides which strain at a net and swallow a camel. He's repeating the same lesson here. They were demanding some details that they, they own, they, they create themselves, but they were reject the essential. For instance, they were condemning Christ because Christ healed people on Sabbath. But the same Sabbath they had a committee meeting to decide how to kill Christ. So blind. Brother, can we fall in the same mistake? Yes. Sure, we can. We can. We can be very zealous in some details, but without love, without mercy, without righteousness. Many may tight meant and rule, but neglect the weighty matters, mercy and the love of God. To walk humbly with God is essential. I will stress this point. To walk humbly with God is essential to the perfection of Christian character. God requires undeviated principle in the minutest details of the transaction of life. Said Christ, he that's faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Uh, let us read verse 25 and 26. Someone else, please. There is another essential point, brethren. Brethren, a question, an individual question now. Are we zealous about our heart more than our exterior or otherwise? Or are we more zealous about our outward appearance than with our heart? What's the lesson Christ gave here? If we, are, if we are careful to have our heart clean, how would, what would happen outside? If you, are poor, if you are pure inside, what would be the result? If we are, if we are pure inside in our heart, what would be the result? We will be pure outside. Do you agree? But we can be apparently pure outside with the, our heart full of hatred, bitterness, and uncleanness. Where is, where is the place where we should start? Outside or inside? Inside. 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 That's the, that the right way. We should be pure inside. Then we'll be pure outside also. Uh, Christ used another, another expression, another figure here, verse 27, 28. Continue the same lesson of the previous verse. Who would like to read? 27, 28. Christ made a comparison here. What's that? All went to you. Um, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Because he built the tombs of the prophets and garnished the sepulchres of the righteous. Heard you also? Uh, no, 27, 28. 27. Oh. Ah, 27. I, I, I read 29. Uh, oh, unto you, Israel and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
for you are likened to whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. That's a strong language, very strong language here. Brethren, here in the United States, we have different cemeteries, but in, especially in the Catholic countries, we have beautiful graveyards. They build a, a kind of building <laughs> upon the, the graveyard. And uh, they put uh, several, they spend a lot of money to, to do that. Marble? Marble, yes, and special stones to, for the, the graveyard. Statues of angels. Statues of angels, yes. But to what is inside? Dead bones. Dead bones. And Christ used this, this figure to compare the life of the hypocrites. Outwardly, they are very nice. They are righteous, they are pious. But to what is inside? Uncleanness. Uncleanness. <laughs> I remember that the Apostle Paul used this expression also when he talked to the high priest. You are white wall, white wall. He was offended, but it was true. A mere profession of godliness is worthless. It is he that abides in Christ that is a Christian. Unless the mind of God becomes the mind of man, every effort to purify himself will be useless. For it is, it is impossible to elevate man except through a knowledge of God. The outward gloss may be put on, a man may be as were the Pharisees whom Christ described as whited sepulchers, full of corruption and dead men's bones. But all the deformed of the soul is open to him who judges righteously. And unless the truth is planted in the heart, it cannot control the life. Cleansing the outside of the cup will never make the vessel pure within. A nominal acceptance of truth is good as far as it goes, and not go deeper than this. Uh, I repeat. A nominal acceptance of truth is good as far as it goes, and the ability to give a reason for our faith is a good accomplishment. But if the truth does not go deeper than this, the soul will never be saved then profession is not enough. The heart must be purified from all moral defilement. The heart must be purified. There are too many in families and in the church who make little account of glaring inconsistencies. There are young men who appear what they are not. We could say there are old men also who appear what they are not. They seem honest and true, but they are like white sepulchers, fair widows, but corrupt to the core. The heart is spotted, is stained with sin, and thus the record stands in the <coughs> heavenly courts. A process has been going on in the mind that has made them callous, past feeling. But if the, their characters, weight in the balance of the sanctuary, are pronounced wanting in the great day of God, it will be a calamity that they do, do, now, do not now comprehend. Truths, precious, unturned truths, is to be part of the character. Now, the last part of crisis speaks about the, the procedure of the Pharisees about the sepulchers of the prophets. Brad, do you realize we commit a serious mistake in our life? Many times we don't treat our mother, our father, our family, 
with true respect. Then when they die, then we buy, buy a lot of flowers, we spend a lot of money for the sepulcher. What do you think? Is it true? Many times, brethren, brethren. We forget to give the special attention to our mother when she's alive, our father, our, our, our children. When some accident happens, then we are full of remorse, then we try to compensate. Let's spend a lot of money to show that I love my dear one. But it's too late. That's the reason why Christ praised Mary Magdalene. She gave him a special attention when he was alive. alive. Nicodemus and uh, Joseph, they did a good work also, but after Christ was dead. The rebuke of Christ to the Pharisees is applicable to those who have lost from the heart their first love. A cold legal religion can never lead the soul to Christ, for it is a loveless, Christless religion. When fastings and prayers are practiced in a self-justifying spirit, they are abominable to God. The solemn assembly for worship, the round of religious ceremonies, the external humiliation, the imposed sacrifice, all proclaim to the world the testimony that the doer of the things consider himself a righteous. The things call attention to the, to the observer of rigorous duties, <coughs> saying, this man is entitled to heaven. But it is all a deception. Works will not buy for us an entrance into heaven. The one great offering that has been made is ample for all who will believe. Now, just one phrase here says, to a people in whose hearts his law is written, the favor of God is assured. They are one with him. Then, brethren, who is, who is God's people? Who is God's people? Those who, in whose heart the law is written. To a people in whose hearts his law is written, the fear of God is assured. They are one with him. Now, brother, let us read something about the blessings. What's the first blessing in Matthew chapter 5? Verse 3, who would like to read? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Brethren, it is good to be poor. It seems an inconsistency here. Blessed are the poor. And some people, they misinterpret this. They say, ah, oh, we are God's people because we are poor. We don't have money. We don't have house, we have no car. I am a very poor guy. Then I am very blessed. Very blessed. Poor, in spirit. poor in spirit. Amen. But another question, brother. Being poor in spirit is a virtue. How about the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3? Are they poor in spirit? They are. They don't recognize that. But they are poor in spirit. They are not only poor. What the true witness say? Blind. You are Blind. miserable. You are wretched. Then, brother, I understand that being a poor, either in financial situation or poor in spirit, is not a blessing. The, the, the question is that the blessing is to recognize that. Because what's the main problem is the Laodicean people? Don't recognize. Not recognize. They don't recognize. You don't know. Because they are poor. 
they are miserable. Now the problem is not that, because there is a remedy for everything. But the main problem is said, it's said, you don't know that you are poor. That's the situation. In the days of Christ, the religious leaders of the people felt that they were rich in spiritual treasure. The prayer of the Pharisee, oh God, I thank thee that I'm not as the rest of men. Were the Pharisee poor people? <coughs> Spiritual poor? Sure they were. But how they consider themselves? Rich. Rich. They were poor. And then the, if Christ says, blessed are the poor in spirit, if we understand literally just because being poor, something's wrong here. Because uh, the Pharisees, they were poor. The Lord sin, they are poor. But the difference is that it says, this prayer of the Pharisee expressed the feeling of his class and to a great degree of the whole nation. But in the throng that surrounded Jesus, there were some who had a, a sense of their spiritual poverty. To these Christ blessed. He who feels whole, who thinks he is reasonably good. Brethren, what do we think about us? Are we good people? Hmm? Are we good people? What do you think about myself? Because we can say, we can, we can play humbleness. We can say, I'm not so good, but I'm not so bad either. I'm not so good, but I'm not, <coughs> I, I'm not so good, but there are some people who are worse than me. Is this a, a dangerous position, brethren? Amen. Oh, yes. Dangerous position. Because who, those who consider themselves really poor, honestly, they can be helped. But those who think this way, I'm not so poor, but I'm not so rich. I'm not so good, but I, I'm not so bad either. What's the position? Hmm. Look, he who feels whole, who thinks that he's reasonably good, <coughs> and is content with his condition, does not seek to become a partake of the grace and the righteousness of Christ. Pride feels no need, and so it closed the heart against Christ. Which class closed the heart against Christ? Those who think that they are reasonably good. There is no room for Jesus in the heart of such a person. There is no room, because they feel Good. Those who are rich and honorable in their own eyes do not ask in faith and receive the blessing of God. They feel that they are full. Therefore, they go away empty. Those who know that they cannot possibly save themselves or of themselves do any righteous action, <coughs> are the ones who appreciate the help that Christ can bestow. They are the poor in spirit whom he declares to be blessed. Who? Those who recognize their true condition. Those can be helped. Those can be blessed. Let's consider verse 4. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Who are blessed here? Blessed are they that mourn. What kind of mourning here? Because all of us, we, we have sadness, we have problems. I remember that when my youngest brother died, I was terribly affected. I spent many days suffering. But what kind of 
mourning is mentioned here. Sin. sin, yeah. And there is a, just a, a, a essential phrase here. The mourning here brought to view is true heart sorrow for sin. True heart sorrow for sin. But about someone else's sin? It's true that uh, if we love our brethren and sisters, and when we see that they are in trouble, we suffer. That's mm -hmm. true. But the main point I should mourn for my, my own sin. <coughs> then I, I can be ready to help others. Because if I am very zealous to, to point the finger, the brethren, oh, that brother, he's in very good, very bad shape, spiritually speaking. That sister, she has serious problem. But I, for, I forget myself. I don't see my own sin, my own problem. Then I can be a, a very severe judge to judge others. But we should judge first ourselves. God reveals to us our guilt that we may flee to Christ and through him be set free from the bondage of sin and rejoice in the liberty of the sons of God. In true contrition, we may come to the foot of the cross and there live our burdens. Where is the place to live our burdens? At the foot of the cross. Brethren, sometimes we use, we use it to complain our problems to someone else. That's common. We have true friends. We can open to them the, our problems. But what's the, what's the result? When I, I, I tell someone else my problem, I'm just transferring the, transferring the problem, no solution. I may make someone else to suffer also. Amen. Amen. Brethren, we started the lesson today that Christ is the wonderful counselor. We should take all our problems to him. Mm -hmm. His will, not just to hear. You know there is course, courses in the university about counseling. People, they, are, they learn how to hear people in problems. But I think that our main work as counselor is to direct people to the wonderful counselor, Amen. who is Christ. That's our work. Not to solve the problem of the people, but to, to show them the wonderful counselor that we have. Do we, li do we like trials, brethren? No, <laughs> against our nature. But the spirit of prophecy says that uh, the trials of life are God's workmen to remove the impurities and the roughness <coughs> from our character. Amen. Then we should praise the Lord for trials, even though they are not so agreeable to us. Now let us go to verse 5. Who, who are mentioned here? Amen. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Am I meek? Are you meek? But let us examine ourselves. Are we? We should, we should be. We should be. But are we in reality? That's that just a challenge. Patient and gentleness and the wrong were not characteristic <laughs> prized by the heathen or by the Jews. The statement made by Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he was the meekest man upon the earth would not have been regarded by the people of this, his time as a commendation. It would rather have excited pity or contempt. But uh, what kind of people the, the world praise? The meek people, they are not noticed. Uh, I always talk to someone, and he mentioned about Bush. He said, oh, I like Bush because 
He decided to do the war, and he's making the war. He's a very firm man to make war. That's how Misha has got people? No. The independence and self-supremacy in which we glory are seeing their true vileness as tokens of servitude to Satan. Human nature is ever struggling for expression, ready for contest, but he who learns of Christ is empty of self, of pride, of love of supremacy, and there is silence in the soul. Does God's people like supremacy? No. No way. It is the love of self that destroys our peace. While self is all alive, we stand ready, continue to guard it from mortification, insult. But when we are dead, and our life is hid with Christ in God, we shall not take neglects or slights to hurt. We shall be deaf to reproach and blind to scorn and insult. Brother, what is my reaction when we, I, I offended? I offended. What's my reaction? Just for consideration. Now, the meekness of Christ manifested in the home will make the inmates happy. It provokes no quarrel gives back no angry answer, but soothes the irritated temper and diffuses a gentleness that is felt by all within its charmed circle. Wherever cherished, it makes the family of earth a part of the one great family above. Brethren, I, would like, I always I like to stress this point at home. Because here he in the church, we are very polite people. <laughs> but I don't know about our homes. Are we polite with each other at home? <coughs> How I deal with my wife and my children? <coughs> How the wife deals with husband? Do they treat each other as in the beginning, when they knew each other? But the meekness of Christ manifests in the home will make the inmates happy. Now let us read verse 6, chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Can we produce righteousness in ourselves? Yeah. Yes, we can. But what kind of righteousness? Self-righteousness? Self -righteousness? No. Isaiah 64, 6. That's the kind of righteousness that we can produce. Filthy? Rags. Now, what is righteousness? And how can we obtain it? No one is true <laughs> righteous, yes. Righteous is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love. 1 John 4, 16. It is conformity to the law of God, for all thy commandments are, are righteousness. Psalm 119, 172. And love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13, 10. Righteousness is love, and love is the light and the life of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving Him. Brethren, I understand that this is the only way to be righteous. Only way. There is no other. There is no other option. There is no alternative way. I repeat, I, I, I enjoy this quotation here. 
Righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God's love. <coughs> Many times we try to divide love and righteousness. There is separation between love and righteousness? No. It says, Righteousness is love. And the love is the fulfillment, fulfilling of the law. Righteousness is love. And love is the, is the light and the life of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving Him. We cannot separate the righteousness of Christ from Christ. The only way to receive the righteousness is to receive is receiving Christ. As we receive Christ, we receive righteousness. Not by painful struggles or wearsome toil, not by gift or sacrifice is righteousness obtained, but it is freely given to every soul who hungers and thirsts to receive it. And what's the only way to receive the righteousness? Is receiving Christ as our Savior. No human agent can supply that which will satisfy the hunger and thirst of the soul. But Jesus, say, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. And he that believes on me shall never thirst. And brethren, you'd like to finish with the verse 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Am I merciful? Are we merciful? Brethren, uh, naturally, we are merciful with ourselves and severe with others. But the true Christian is the opposite. When we are true Christian, we are severe with ourselves and merciful to others. That's the symptom of a true Christian. The heart of man is by nature cold and dark and unloving. Whenever one manifests a spirit of mercy and forgiveness, he does it not of himself, but to the influence of the divine spirit moving upon his heart. We love, we love because he first loved us. God is himself the source of all mercy. His name is merciful and gracious. He does not treat us according to our desert. He does not ask if we are worthy of his love. But he pours upon us the reach of his love to make us worthy. He is not vindictive. He seeks not to punish, but to redeem. Even the severity which he manifests through his providence is manifest for the salvation of the wayward. He yearns with intense desire to relieve the woes of men and to apply his balsam to their wounds. It's true that God will not means, will by no means clear the guilt, but he would take away the guilt. That's his plan. Amen. Amen. The merciful shall obtain mercy. The merciful shall obtain mercy. Brother, I, I read a very wonderful definition about uh, grace and mercy. The author said, Grace is to give us what we do not deserve. Mercy is not to give us what we deserve. We deserve what? Oh, no. Eternal death. We deserve eternal death. But God gives us salvation. We don't deserve salvation. 
but God give us salvation by his mercy, by his love. May the Lord help us, brethren, to consider seriously our needs. And the, the message that God give us is that I put before you blessings and curses. But I advise you, choose, choose blessings, choose life. May this be my and your experience. Amen. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus our Savior, we come before thee with thanksgiving for all thy mercies, all thy love, all the, the grace that you give us. And we praise the Lord for thy word, thy invitation. And help us to recognize our sinful condition. And give us power, Lord, to surrender ourselves completely to thy control. Forgive us our sins. Bless thy people here and everywhere in the world. You know us individually, Lord. You know our hearts. You know how we need thee. Help us to overcome our defect of character. Help us to accept your righteousness and to reflect your character in our lives. Help us to be your representatives at home, in your church, and wherever we go. Amen. Give us thy Holy Spirit. Give us power to preach thy word. And not only that, help us to live according to thy word. Amen. Give us grace, Lord, to be ready for the coming of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.